get cool and sit cross-legged. We'll see how long this lasts. Hi everyone, welcome back. I wanted to do another wrap up. We're already done with February. Gross. Everything's going by so, so, so fast. Uh, and February was no different. February flew by and I read four books. Again, doesn't seem insane. Doesn't seem like that's anything to brag about. But again, I'm busy, okay? I'm busy. And four books for me is a lot. Um, and I kind of took it easy on myself with this one too with, uh, with how short they are. Short, but powerful. Sorry if I look tired. I'm filming this on a Tuesday, but I went to my friend's house last night on a Monday. We made mashed potatoes. <laughs> Things got lit. <laughs> and I was like, I gotta go. Oh, I'm tired. I gotta go home. <laughs> so forgive me if I look a little pale. So yeah, I just wanted to go through each of these books and maybe also give you some reading updates as to what I'm reading now. Hey, what's up? Do you also look like death? <laughs> okay, so first book, this was actually a gift my brother gave to my boyfriend for Christmas, um, but that means I also get it for Christmas. So it's Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism by Amanda Montell. I first became aware of this book really when it was published because I feel like this is like the grooviest most amazing cover that I think everybody was just like, what is this book? Um, I've seen it all over Goodreads and it just looks so cool. Like it looks cool. It's just a very cool looking book. I was always very interested in reading this and my brother was trying to pick out books for my boyfriend. He was like, oh, what should I get? And he like showed some options and I was like, what about the cultish book? Like get him the cultish book. <laughs> I'm evil. I really just wanted it for myself. But I mean, this is something that my boyfriend would also find interesting. Yeah, this was really good. I gave this four stars. I think I gave it four stars for just the sheer enjoyability of it. And I think that that really lends itself to how well the book is written. This, I don't know how else to describe this, except that a millennial wrote this. A millennial very much wrote this book, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, I think there's the boomers out there are like, oh, the millennials. No, I think that's a good thing. Like, I think she just has like a very easygoing kind of casual authority because she definitely knows what she's talking about and you don't ever question it. But she just, she'll like bring in slang or she'll like, the way she'll phrase something just sounds very young, <laughs> which I think is cool because I've, I've never read a book, a nonfiction book that has that tone before. I'm usually reading like some old crusty man like some classic nonfiction book where I'm like, he's definitely authority, an authority, but he can like loosen up a little bit. Amanda Montel is like a girlfriend like talking to you about this over drinks. So basically this book is, it's nonfiction. It's my first nonfiction of the year. And I really enjoyed it. I also would say anyone who doesn't like nonfiction, I'd say this is actually a really, really good first stop. I would recommend this to anyone who thinks that they don't want to do nonfiction because this is, this is nonfiction. It's historical, it's sociological, it's also linguistic, which I've never really read books about linguistics, but now I'm very interested in getting into that. So what is this book about? This book basically goes into cults, woo, goes into cults um, and how they function. So it's not necessarily a book about cults per se. Like if you want, because I maybe know a little bit too much about Heaven's Gate, but, <laughs> but if you, want to deep dive into those cults like Heaven's Gate, about Jonestown, uh, about Sinon. If you want to deep dive into those, you're not really going to get it from this book. She does do a good job in introducing those to you in case you've never heard of these phenomenons. But this is not really about the cults themselves. This is how a lot of these very dangerous cults and the more innocuous ones, how they came to power by using language. So she makes this argument that cults and cult leaders like know very specifically how to harness language to be able to get people to follow them and to die for them and just to to grow an affinity to their group. It's interesting the way she lays the book out because she starts with the most dangerous ones. She's like, these are the ones, the big ones that you know about that had some like very dire consequences like Jonestown and Heaven's Gate. But then as she progresses through the book, she talks about cults or place that, places that use cultish language that seem more and more innocuous to kind of get you into the idea of like, oh, cultish language isn't just used with Jonestown. It's like used with like workout groups and like soul cycle is kind of one. Like, so she's making the argument that like it's around us always just in varying degrees. And she goes into Scientology a lot because we all know, sorry, Church of Scientology, 
you can come for me i don't care then it goes into mlms and then it goes into like fitness culture so a lot of like crossfit and soul cycle and then it goes into social media influencers at, at the end saying that like they're kind of this new digital wave in the way that they speak and the way that they engage their audiences very very interesting again like i'm someone who knows a lot about cults so i was kind of like i really want to get in the nitty-gritty of of heaven's gate but that's not what this book is about and i'm not going to hold anything against this book for not being that just basically it's about using how these groups use language to be able to engage their audiences and get you to keep going to keep following along because she makes the argument that like we in america especially um, are just very tuned into this language and it's just part of the fabric of the country so very interesting read would would recommend and especially which i might make a video of this of like nonfiction to read if you're really afraid of nonfiction, because this is certainly one anyone can do great cultish the next one is a complete 180 snow country by yasunari kawabata this was really good i think this one took me a little bit to get into like i was a little like okay we're moving and again i move slow i love slow moving books we've stan dickens on this channel i'm a huge dickens fan which you know that man moves slow so i don't ever mind that but i think because i was reading something as quick and snappy as cultish that when i read this i had to kind of like transition my mind a bit but when I did, the payoff was incredible. So this book is about, basically, this man, Shimamura. He works in the city. Well, actually, hmm, funny. He doesn't work. He has inherited money. Um, and he kind of is just, like, living his best life in Tokyo, being very rich. He's married. He's just kind of living his life. But every so often he goes to this, it's an unnamed town, but he goes to this town and he just kind of like goes to the the local inns and is just kind of like floating about and, and doing his thing. And he falls in love, or at least falls in love, but grows an attachment at the very least to this woman named Kamako, who when he first meets her, she's like kind of a geisha, but kind of not. When they meet again, she's now fully a geisha and she's working in this kind of uh, spa resort town as a geisha um and it's just about their relationship the kind of odd moments they have together the restraint because they you can tell they so clearly feel for each other but they're exercising such perfect restraint that they never i mean the words i love you never come out in this book i mean there's not too much plot it is kind of like the no plot all vibes kind of book all we know is that shimamura and, and kamako they want each other so badly but they don't do anything about it really except these little like stabs at one another and these little injustices towards one another but then also just like very like they'll say just very like tender things that mean something else so it's all just the and it's it just feels very japanese to me because it's very restrained but very subtle but yet underneath you can tell there's so much feeling. It's kind of like, I mean, I had just been in a scene study class where someone did Chekhov. A this felt like Chekhov to me because Chekhov also is like, no, no, we're talking about literally anything else and we're talking about philosophy and we're talking about emerging psychology. And, but oh my God, we really just want to, we want to make out so bad. It feels very similar to that. There's just like underneath there's a whole world and especially at the end, which I didn't see coming at all, may we say came out of nowhere but i was like just swept up in it at that point and the the connections to nature and beauty nature and love in this especially are evident at the end but throughout the whole thing and it's just really beautiful it's funny too i picked this because it's like snow country i live in chicago it's gonna be snowing i read this like the week there was no snow and it was like 50 degrees here so i was like okay not not quite the vibe i was gonna go for but okay this is one even though it's small this was a short read and so i was like oh we'll breeze through this i don't think this is the kind of book that you can just be like i'm just gonna read it i truly think in this one like like you do want to take your time because like it, it it just sits like there's stuff in here that just sits for a while and then grows later and you patience will reward you with this one even though it is very short so snow country great next one is once there was a war I read this for the Game of Tomes book club um, here on YouTube. This book was being contrasted with 
A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway, which if you saw my video for my January wrap up, you will know that I loved that book. I really loved it. This is the book that was contrasting it. Farewell to Arms is World War One. This one is World War II. Um, you know, I was pretty neutral on this one. I liked it. I liked it. I would not say I was like <gasps> in love with it like I was with Farewell to Arms. This one's okay. This is John Steinbeck. He was working as a correspondent for the New York Herald Tribune. So he was on, literally in World War II, like on the ground with these soldiers writing stuff for the newspaper that he was sending back. Some of it feels very rushed. Some of it feels a little unedited. Some of it, of course, was very edited though, because he would put stuff in that got redacted and it's just gone forever. So that, I mean, that part of it is kind of cool, but it's, you know, I, because their old arms was just you got so attached to those characters because you went through a whole novel and it's fiction with them it just feels different because this is non-fiction and there's not really any returning characters a lot of the men are in this are just very anonymous he kind of just talks about like this soldier and that soldier there's a couple returning characters but it you don't get it as emotionally attached which is fine I don't necessarily have to be emotionally attached for me to be like be invested in, in this and a lot of like some of the individual stories were so good. There's one about an elf who got them whiskey and they were like, we swore there was this elf. So like that one was really interesting. Or there was a story about a guy who carried a giant mirror, like a mirror on his back for so long. And like, that was interesting. Like it's all little like snapshots of just strange things that happened in the war that was not being reported on and not being fed by like the propaganda machine. Even though some of this did feel a little bit propaganda-y because as we know, World War II was tightly controlled. Um, so what he could send back, they were obviously gonna be like, mm, mm, a little tweak there. Or just also some of the stuff in here is redacted because it would betray their location <laughs> because they're at war. So some of these were really good. And then some of them are just kind of forgettable. Some of them I was like, especially the strategic ones. I'm sorry, I just, I don't care as much about that when it comes to histories about the war. I care more about like what like the, the chapters about them, like what they carry in their pockets. I'm like, absolutely, that's what I want to know. That's why I'm a big fan of The Things They Carry by Tim O'Brien, because it's all those kind of just like those little psychological happenstances or just, just the weirdness that happens amongst men when they're in such tragic and such stressful circumstances. I just find that more interesting than like, and the enemy was here and we had to go around this way. Like, I just, I just don't care about that. So this was a three star. It was fine. I, I don't think I'm like as attached to this as I need more to be. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so once there was war, John Steinbeck. Oh, but that's not to say though, not to say that John Steinbeck is not a good writer. He definitely is a good writer. Like you can just, you can tell. Um, I'm a big fan, big, big, big fan of Eats of Eden. I've already mentioned in my classics, You Shouldn't Be Afraid to Read, which is another video of mine. Ooh, so good. Such a good book. So I, I am a huge John Steinbeck fan. I just think this one just wasn't. Next one, Angels, Angels Before Man by Raphael Nicholas. Excellent. This was excellent. This was a four star. I think also, again, just for sheer readability, but also pretty amazing because this is a debut novel by this writer. Um, this is a self-published book which I think is really cool. I ordered it off Amazon and they just print it on demand basically. So on the back it has a mark of like when it was printed, which was the day I ordered it uh, and where they printed it from, which was right outside Chicago. So I, I don't know. I just think that that's cool. Um, it's a beautiful cover. It's got kind of that like really smooth kind of feeling to the cover. This was really good. This is like nothing I've ever, like I don't ever read anything like this. Uh, my two friends and I wanted to start a book club and we were like, okay, so if we're doing this book club, we want to make sure that the author is basically anything but a straight white man. <laughs> because a, a lot of books, especially classics, God love them, but a lot of them are straight white men, presumably straight. We were like, no, we want to make sure we read like BIPOC authors um, or queer authors, just something to shake it up a little bit from our usual stuff. And something like either fan either fantasy or horror that was those were the two genres we were really looking for so because this is like book club and we can do it however we wanted we picked each of us picked two books we discussed them and then once we discussed the six books because it's three of us that we had we were like oh we don't know like 
which one of these to pick. They all sound good. So we just like randomly pick names out of a hat and it was this one. This is a retelling. I'm just, the back just says, a queer retelling of the fall of Satan. I was like, when my friend suggested this, I was like, sign me up. Like, I definitely want to read that. And in Eternal Paradise, the most beautiful angel Lucifer struggles with shame, identity, and timidity with little more than the desire to worship his creator. It isn't until the strongest angel, Michael, comes into his life that Lucifer is taught to love himself. Along the way, their friendship begins to bloom into something else. Maybe the first romance in the history of everything. But this god is a jealous one, and maybe paradise is not paradise. So good. I think this writer did a great job. I think, is it told in two parts? And I find it super interesting because the writer says at the very, very beginning of the book, hey, here's some content warning. A lot of this content that I'm warning you about is actually more so in the second part. You don't have to read the second part if you don't want. You can just read the first and the first is its own complete story. And then you can proceed to part two if you want. I just thought that was so interesting because usually they're like, yeah, no, you, this is the book. You read the whole, read the whole thing. But the fact that he was giving you the option, like, no, you don't have to. Like, you can just read part one if you don't want to. And it's true because a lot of part one did not have anything bad in it like that. And then part two, I was like, oh, there we go. Like, and then it was a sharp decline. Um, because it starts off with Lucifer being born. He's the newest angel. He's like the most beautiful angel that they've all ever seen. And it's him getting acquainted with heaven. Uh, he's living in heaven, which basically is just gay paradise. Just living their life. They like have their little jobs, but they don't have to work too much. They go to the bathhouse. They go to sporting events. They just eat food they have tons of jewels it's very like very decadent um and a little bit like it's just a touch hedonistic if hedonism wasn't seen as a sin i guess and then lucifer and michael meet and they kind of get together and then the second part because you know what's ha you know what's gonna happen it's lucifer if you've had judeo-christian influences in your life you know lucifer's gonna fall that's kind of the point um so you know it's coming but he was correct in that if you just wanted to read the first part it was very heartwarming and like left off on like such a very hopeful note that I was like that is nice and then we moved into the second part and I was like oh <laughs> I thought I'd be more emotionally devastated but honestly it was kind of like that genre of like good for her that kind of movie genre that's happening right now where everyone's just like good for her in horror movies when the woman like gets it at the end that is kind of how I felt with Lucifer <laughs> Because I was, I mean, he's the protagonist. He wasn't, I don't think he was my favorite character, but I was cheering him on. And it was just so good. Like, there were so many tender moments. The the descriptions, I think more so in the second part, were just so beautiful and so well done. I think the progression of Lucifer's character, because he starts off very timid and very scared and shy, but very sweet at his core. But then his progression into who he becomes, Lucifer, I think was very well mapped out and well paced. Other characters, eh, Michael, yeah. I would have wanted to see just more scenes of like them just being together. I feel like we had some and, and it was good, but like once we launched into part, part two might've been nice if we had some reprieve, but it felt like part two was really bombarding us with like a lot. But I would have liked like maybe more of just him and Michael just like liking each other, loving each other. This was, I was, I've never read anything like this. This isn't usually a book I ever go for, but I am so glad I read this. I'm so glad we picked it for our group. We still haven't met to discuss it, and so I'm confident in Jess. Hey, when are we doing this? I'm excited to talk with them about this because I think they're going to have some, some good thoughts. And it's always fun to read in groups because someone points something out and you're like, I never, never thought about that, or I completely forgot about that scene. So I'm, I was happy that I read this with with friends so i'm excited to read it or i'm excited to discuss it with them later cool so that is what i read four books cultish snow country once there was a war angels before man i did pretty well uh, but i will give you updates as to what i'm reading now <laughs> okay the book club that i'm a part of at the bookstore near me uh pushed back we canceled our meeting in january so all our books got pushed back which is fine, except that now I'm reading two Victorians at once. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's actually fine. I do really love these authors and I love these books, so I'm not too upset about it, but I am like, gosh darn, this is very, very dense reading. So I am going to throw something else. 
kind of light in at some point during this month. First we have Valette by Charlotte Bronte. This is for that book club. So this was supposed to be due in February and this would have been part of the wrap up part, but uh, got pushed to March. So it's you and me, Lucy, all through March. Actually, I'm getting through this more than I thought I would at this point because I forgot how good this one is. I read this in college a long time ago and I remember like liking it. Like I thought it was good and I liked it and I think I gave it three or four stars, but I just forgot because I haven't read Charlotte Bronte in so long. I was like, I forgot, I forgot how good she is. Like I forgot how good she is in just like laying out a story and like giving you some information, but not a lot, especially with this one. That's the case with the protagonist because Lucy Snow is such an unreliable narrator. She is very reserved. Like she's the narrator and she's supposed to be kind of bearing her soul to you, but she's like very reserved. She doesn't give you all the info. She has so much within her, but she's, and she lets it out sometimes. And then she's like, no, we gotta rein it back, rein it back in. Which I think she's then just like the archetype of the Victorian woman. She's like, I have so many feelings and I have ideas and I want to do things, but also reel it back in, reel it in. She's just so sassy. Like she's so, so sassy and I am so here for it. So this book is about Lucy Snow. She is this woman from... Why am I, why do I have to think hard about that? It's Bronte. She's from England and she was like living for a little bit with her godmother who has a son, but then she leaves them. She goes back to her home. She has some sort of tragedy, which is also why she is unreliable. We don't know what this tragedy was, but it makes her leave home and she has no prospects basically. She winds up in a town called Villette, which is supposed to be like Brussels in Belgium. She doesn't speak French. She just is like, yeah, we'll try this place. And she winds up in the good hands of Madame Beck, who runs this girl's school, and she takes her on as an English teacher. And so it's just about Lucy Snow, like, kind of living this, like, oh, I didn't think I'd be here, like, living that kind of life, and getting to know the people in the town and in the school, maybe having her own little, like, romantic flings, maybe. It's really, it's like a psychological study of just this character. Because the plot, again, it's not really like a very plot-heavy book. I'd say Jane Eyre is more so a plot book. It's a little more episodic. It's a little more her just being like, what are we doing today? Oh, that girl's being a flirt. <laughs> she really, she's so judgmental. But this is great. I mean, I am resonating with this a lot more than I did when I first read it. Like, I'm really hearing her a lot more this time around. So I'm, I'm enjoying it. Actually, I'm definitely gonna finish by the March 20th deadline for this, so I'm very happy about that. And then we're reading <gasps> Sweet David Copperfield. Oh, yes, we're back, we're back on the Dickens. We're back on Dickens. We'll always come back to Dickens. He's always gonna be there. I am reading this for the Game of Tomes, again, back when they were Dickens versus Tolstoy, this would have been the next book, so I think they were just like, all right, well, we'll, we'll do it anyway. Okay, we'll do it live. Anyway, I am really enjoying this. I am really, really enjoying this. And again, that live show isn't until the end of April, so I have two months to read this book. I'm taking my sweet time. I'm taking my sweet, sweet time, and I'm loving it because I'm really getting to know the characters, and I'm also just like taking a really deep dive in how Dickens constructs his stories. I think because I've read enough of his by this point, I can really start seeing his patterns and seeing how he puts it all together. And you I, you can sense it. I sensed it in Dobby and Son, definitely, but definitely here it's him like really coming into himself. It just feels so good. Is there a siege happening? And there's like planes and sirens? Anyway, David Copperfield, delightful. Um, love him as a narrator. I think this is the first book that Dickens decided to use first person. It just makes such a difference. And I think it's very significant he chose first person for this book because I think he based a lot of his life off this one. Not a lot, but at, at very loosely there's a lot of ties to himself and this character. And it is Dickens, of his novels, he said this is his favorite one. So you can tell he like really cares about this character and cares about his fate and the other characters in the book. Just lovely. Um, the relationship he has with his nurse uh, and, and her family, her stepfather, and the guy who, uh, headmaster of the school he's at. Ugh, just awful. 
just awful. Miss Dickens being like, here's a child in our society and here's how he's suffering. He's suffering and it just shows that this society needs major reform because we have students, we have children who are like cast aside by their step parents, who are just completely abused in schools, who are working, <laughs> like and and starving. Like it's just him like pointing out all of the social flaws through this one child. David Copperfield, even though like he is the protagonist and he is kind of like a perfect little lad, he still feels realistic. Like, I think because Dickens is letting us inside his mind by being like, I am, or I'm doing this, I think it lends itself to be a little bit more realistic. So, it's so good. It's so good. I'm really, I'm really, really liking this. So, again, it's not due till April. I'm going to take my sweet time with this, but I would not be surprised if this winds up in the March wrap-up, because... Oh yeah, I'm reading two Victorians at once. I think I'm going to tag on another, like, short non-victorian book because i like having at least like three books going at once that's usually my sweet spot so i'll pick up another one i'll pick up another thank you thank you for coming back if you've been here before welcome again if you're here for the first time hopefully not the last um subscribe if you feel like it if you don't want to you don't have to i'm just here for fun I'm just here for, I'm here for Dickens. You know what? That's what I'm here for. I'm here for Dickens. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Stay safe.